Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are looking forward to talking to you today about whatever's of interest to you, but we're also going to be talking to a special guest we have, Mr. Mike Shoup. Uh, he is owner of the Antique Rose Emporium, and we're going to talk about antique roses, uh, just how to have success with roses, how to use roses. But feel free to call in. Perhaps you'll have a question for Mike or for me on some other topic. Uh, we're still open lines today, so write down the number so you can give us a call. It's 845-5689, 845-5689. Or by email at garden success at tamu dot edu garden success one word at tamu dot edu. Well, Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Skip. It's it is nice good. to be here. It is good to it is good to uh, have you on. Uh, I think the topic of roses is one that just really resonates with a lot of people. There's just it's kind of like tomatoes in the vegetable garden. Maybe it, it's like the the focus of a lot of vegetable attention when we look at the landscape roses are just you center know, stage roses have gone back through history in terms of uh, their interest with mankind for for, for forever uh, interesting enough though uh, you know I went to school at Texas A&M got my master's degree in horticulture and it was the one plant I swore I didn't have nothing to do with mm -hmm. <laughs> Because the roses have had this reputation of being fussy, you yeah. have to spray them, you have to prune them on a certain day in February with, you know, the inner nodes facing north. I mean, all yeah. these rules, it just didn't yeah. make any sense to me. I was very interested in just having easy plants to grow in the landscape and yeah. in your garden. And so, obviously, something changed there to, right. to change my mind, and and it and it's just been a wonderful story. Uh for me to be able to now be an advocate of the rose. Yeah, no kidding. Well, tell us a little bit about what got you interested in plants in general, and then specifically, what drew you to roses? I was lucky enough to find out that I could actually make a living growing plants, because I, when I was a child, I grew tomatoes, and mm -hmm. I just I just loved it. So being able to go to A&M and get my master's in horticulture was a uh, was a it was a, a a real bounty for me, and so I went to work right after that, growing uh, plants for the landscape. And uh, uh, was uh, you know, this was a long time ago. It's 1976. I graduated, so we were growing photinia and oh ligustrum and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And uh, you know, we were able to be successful because the economy was just going crazy right. in in that time period. You know, I went home to my wife and I said, we're going to be rich. This is so easy. <laughs> well, you know how that is. Oh, but boy. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it completely changed. The economy went south. We had a recession in the early 80s. And I was left holding the bag trying to figure out what I was going to do because mm -hmm. I couldn't sell what I was growing. Mm -hmm. And that started it. And I was able to go out with some early plantsmen like Lynn Lowry into the wilds of Texas mm -hmm. and, and, and bring back plants that evolved here in Texas as an alternative to these ligustrum and things I was growing. Right. I thought maybe that would be a practical source. Well, it was a difficult uh, sell, to be mm -hmm. honest. People didn't know about natives and stuff. But it was on those jaunts into the back roads of Texas that we found roses mm -hmm. growing in abandoned home sites mm -hmm. and cemeteries, places where uh, you weren't getting the, the the care of human hands to grow these plants. So right. this was completely antagonistic to what I thought about roses. I thought they had to have, you know, a lot of care, a lot of pampering and yeah. expertise in order to grow them. So it changed my view of these plants. And so I started started looking at this more closely, bringing cuttings back to the nursery. They grew and flourished and and, and I saw big differences in what I was finding than mm -hmm. what was being offered Right. modernly. And the big takeaway with that is is that these time-tested plants that lived under the laws of Mother Nature where mm -hmm. they could take the blue northers and the droughts and things and still be there yeah. uh, changed my mind about them. And so we were able to offer these in the spirit that these were resilient, tough plants. But 
what we found are the characteristics in these plants were amazing. And number one is is fragrance. Many of these roses were fragrant, and that was bred out of a lot of these modern roses. Yes. And to me, if you don't have fragrance, you don't have the, you know, the memory or the emotion or the the, the reason to grow them. Because, uh, yeah. I mean, if you have a pretty picture of a rose, I mean, if you have a rose and you smell it, you know, you might as well be looking at a pretty picture of a rose in a book if it doesn't have any fragrance. You know, there you go. So. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because uh, I bet the vast majority of listeners have not been have not noticed or distinguished the different types of scent in roses. Uh, could you expound on that a little bit? Uh, they don't uh, all smell the same. No. I mean, you you think that uh, the, if a rose has fragrance, you know, you, you're you thinking, well, that it's just the same fragrance. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not at all. There are so many nuances to fragrance, and it really um, triggers a response in, in people, too, the, the, that that is uh, unique. It's... Um, right. It, it's kind of like a throwback in time. It, it, if you have smelt that rose, you can remember the time you first smelt it, kind of thing. Boy, boy, scents have that. They have a very powerful, powerful connection to your uh, of, of, of your memory. Yeah. And uh, and and tr- also it it affects the emotion. I remember when we first planted the Cecil Bruna rose, the sweetheart rose, mm-hmm. on an arbor in our garden. And a year later, in April, it was in full bloom, and it was about oh six eight feet tall, and it was had these clusters of flowers on it, and then this elderly lady went up and smelt it, and she turned down on me with kind of tears welling up, mm. and I said, I haven't smelt that since I was at my grandmother's oh, house. Oh, boy. And so wow. it's that kind of vehicle that fragrance is mm. that taps into a, a very important aspect of gardening, I think. And roses have banana cream pie, citrus, oh. tobacco. There's so many different nuances to the mm. fragrance of roses that it's well worth breeding roses to bring back that fragrance. Now, is, is that somehow connected to the what are called the tea roses or uh, tea group of roses? Or what, why are they called tea? Well, that's, that's a whole near, well, I mean, that's a good point because uh, I think they were named tea because they came on the tea boats from China. Ah, okay. okay. Back, uh, you know, in the early 1800s. They, okay. they were, we were uh, actually bringing roses from China into America. Okay. And these were roses that uh, were very unique in the fact that they brought ever-blooming quality to all our roses. Mm-hmm. Roses there very to important. before mm-hmm. were only spring-blooming. The European roses, the damas, the albas, things like that. Mm-hmm. But these China roses bloom nine months out of the year. And they evolved in a part of China that's very similar to our Gulf Coast region. So okay. that's why tea roses, China roses okay. are all... Uh, great for this area. And these are the kind of roses, ironically, we still find surviving in these cemeteries yeah. planted 100 years ago. So really yeah, fascinating. That, that is. That really is. And so I, when I think about rose scents and stuff, uh, the Rosemary Pavier, it's a little mm-hmm. kind of a short, knee-high-ish. It gets bigger in the right soils. but uh, And it it has to me kind of a baby powder fragrance. Uh, I don't know how. You, how would you describe that? <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a good description. Okay. Uh, yeah, Marie Pavier. It, it it's um it's in the Polyantha group of roses, mm-hmm. it, and it's a uh, it's a it's a thornless rose, mm-hmm. and when it blooms, it has this wonderful um, uh like well like baby powder or uh, what is that? Uh, I forgot the name of the of the of the chemical that creates that oh, smell. Oh, okay. But uh. But yes, it, it does, and there's uh, the, it's really closely related to Cecil Brunner, mm. which has more of a rose, you know, a r- little bit more of a rose perfume fragrance Traditional to it. Rose. So, mm. but uh, but the, but you hit on something that's very interesting, and that is that uh, people's takeaway from a lot of fragrances are, are very different yes. as well. <laughs> yes. I mean, well, we've made the mistake of saying this rose is very fragrant in some of our catalogs, and right. people will write back and say that they flat out can't smell it. Or, oh wow. So that is a, something that is a measure within the individual, mm-hmm. and you've got to be real careful about that. Yes, and, and some of the plants out there, I don't even know how to describe the fragrance, you know, in, in general. Well, okay, here's an example. Uh, Copper Canyon Daisy uh, is a, in the marigold, it's a type of marigold, right. essentially. And to me, it smells like a cross between citrus and pine on steroids. Ah. And some people, it just offends their nose to the point of, they can't take it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there's so many different fragrances out there. We, at this time of year, we have a uh, mist flower blooming, mm-hmm. and um, it has. It, it, 
well, it's kind of crude to say this, but it, it kind of smells like um, a floral cat urine. <laughs> so, you know, which yeah. maybe turns you off, but actually the fragrance lingers and is, is fairly pleasant. So, well, you know, some of the, I guess, the, is it the, some of the paper whites, I believe, uh, have that, that cat urine description. I've heard that on some of them as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but, but I think in general, the, the fragrances that come from flowers, roses included, are, are so important to the, Mm-hmm. To the you know to the element of gardening, yeah, uh, they do create kind of uh, I think the memory or the emotion and the uh, the feeling that you should be out out there you know mingling with them and uh-huh. it's it's a it's a I think it's a trait that is missing in some of our applications of gardening and it needs to be brought back. Well, a long time ago, uh, I was involved with a community garden and a gentleman. I guess he was probably ninety two years old. Uh, he would always say, roses leave part of their fragrance in the hand that bestows them. And I yeah. know you've heard that many yeah. times yeah. probably. But uh, when, when you bring, it's one thing to buy a bunch of straight-stemmed hybrid tea roses and give them to somebody. That's pretty. That's fine. I get that. But when you take the antiques and those types of roses and put them together and walk across the street or next door, it, it's a it's a different kind of gift. It It truly is. And it's it's one that we've kind of really try to 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 educate people with. We mm-hmm. actually have a fragrance gallery where oh. we'll cut a lot of the varieties of our roses, put them in little vases, and mm-hmm. not only can they see what the rose looks like, you know, with the name in front mm-hmm. of it there, but they'll walk along and smell them. And it's just an amazing thing to watch people smell these different roses right. because, in some cases, they hit something that that they know that they smelt in the past. Mm-hmm. And they'll stammer and they'll pull out a piece of paper out of their <clears throat> pocket and yeah. write down that name and rush over to the nursery to, yeah. to find it, to buy it, you know. And <clears throat> it's, a, it's, it's just a very powerful part mm-hmm. of the a process of selecting a rose it is. that we feel is important. And, and tragically, we've got away from that with the breeding of the rose for the florist industry. Mm-hmm. And they have bred them to the point where we can't grow them in our backyards because mm-hmm. – uh, they're so particular and fussy, uh, and and at the same time, uh, they don't have any fragrance, mm-hmm. and, and they don't have any uh, character either because they've all been bred to be these erect soldiers that you put into these yeah. rectangle prisons that we call rose gardens. And, and for a lot of people, when they picture roses, they picture that structure of plant and that type of bloom. Uh, but one of the things that I think is just a huge selling point, uh, well, for example, some of the shrub roses, if, if there wasn't a single bloom on them, they would still be serving as that shrub that you wanted there. But we don't just settle with that. We actually get cycles of bloom. Now, I know, uh, let's see, uh, oh, gosh, Belinda's Dream is not an antique, uh, you know, bred by a math prof here. Uh, but that is just such a beautiful shrub, ro- Rose, and, yeah. and in addition to – it also is fragrant, by the way. I, Belinda's Dream is, is – a what I would call the perfect transition rose. It's got all the qualities of an old garden rose, tough, yes. lots of foliage, uh, blooms repeatedly, right. has a traditional upright, high-centered, show-quality flower. It, but at the same say, time- For most people would say that looks like a rose, whereas it looks like other rose, forms, they may th- think that doesn't look like a rose. But it can be put into your garden with all these other plants around it and just let it ebb and flow through the seasons just like all the other plants mm-hmm. in your garden do, and you don't have to fuss over it. And that's that's what roses should be. And, yeah. and ironically, or not ironically, interestingly, most of the industry now, star roses and, of course, the knockout series of roses mm-hmm. and all these breeders are now concentrating their efforts on this disease resistance. Yes. Yes. And they're bringing fragrance back. So we're at a cutting edge of time when I think roses are going to be a whole lot more friendly for people mm-hmm. to, to embrace and to, to grow in their gardens. Well, when when uh, the time when I was in Houston as an agent, Harris County, uh, we cooperated with uh, some others outside our area on some trials of some new roses down there. And uh, I know you probably know who Gay Hammond is yeah. if, you're a, if you're a rose person. Uh, Gay was involved in that and some others, and we planted them out, no care, 
and came back to see how they're going to do. And I know the earth kind roses are treated that way uh, up in Dallas when they test them out. I think that's a good practice, you know. There's you there's lots of trials going on now. The AR, ARS is doing one in Shreveport. Uh, AGRS is doing them in regions throughout the United States, and mm -hmm. we're very involved with that. It used to be that um, uh, the the hospital there in Houston with Gay he planted mm -hmm. a bunch out in, as a trial garden. Mm -hmm. um, and we're planting them all the time too. Some of the roses that we're we're, in, we're breeding with, mm -hmm. in in order to see if we can get a rose that is that is black spot resistant. Mm -hmm. Interesting, uh, you know, Radler produced yeah. knockout rose, and mm -hmm. they essentially don't get black black spot, and that's why they're so so important and so uh, easy for us to grow. Uh, but we want to improve the flower on the rose. It, we don't want to see knockouts everywhere, you know, because they're everywhere now. Uh, they ring. are everywhere. And, I, I and, saw them in a McDonald's parking lot in Chicago. Oh, I mean, they're, they're, just, they're everywhere. just all over the place. And that's not a bad thing for them, but, the, but, but we can do better. We can put beautiful, fragrant flowers yes. of, of interesting character mm -hmm. on these healthy bushes. And so our breeding is at the point where we can have out knockout plants with mm -hmm. beautiful, fragrant flowers. And so right. our breeding efforts are going that way. And that's why I say it's such a, a cutting edge in time to where we're going to have some really spectacular mm -hmm. landscape garden plants that are called roses. Yeah. And that's just a unique thing in our industry. That is a, that is a very uh, nice thing, a uh, nice uh, thing to uh, see as a, as a change because... I remember I had the same opinion of roses going through college and horticulture, and uh, yeah, I just like I don't want to spend my weekends mixing up smelly water while I stand with an umbrella so it doesn't get rained on. Uh, it just, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense yeah. at all. So and we've gotten away from that so much. Now that doesn't degrade the the, the floral industry in terms no. of their best of flower. I mean, all those things they they still can be bred for that, mm -hmm. but. Uh, when we're trying to breed for the common homeowner who mm -hmm. wants to be successful, uh, we need a plant that they can grow without right. having the, the, the fussy culture that these hybrid tea florist qualities uh, plants used to have. That, that is so true. Well, if you're listening today, you're listening to Garden Success, and you're probably thinking it's a tape show because there's a guest on the show today. But it's not. We're here live, so we invite you to give us a call. It's 845 Five six eight nine, and by email garden success at t a m u dot e d u garden success at t a m u dot e d u. We're here with uh, Mike Shoup, who is owner of the Antique Rose Emporium, and we're talking about a lot of things roses. One of the one of the big hurdles that we now face in roses is uh, a disease called rose rosette. Uh, and I, I've seen it in several places around Texas, and it, it's a it's a game changer. You know? It is. It's a it's 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 a it's a scary disease. Mm -hmm. um, it, epicenter in Texas was really in the Dallas area about five years ago or so, mm -hmm. and that's when we noticed a lot of people even stopping the orders of roses mm -hmm. to go up there, and so we really are concerned about that. Rose right. rosette is, is a virus, and if a rose shows symptoms of it and has it, well, then that rose right. cannot be saved. It's, it's a goner. Right. And so the protocols now are such that uh, we're actually making some impact into keeping it from spreading so bad because right. the, 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 the news, uh, the, the dictum is to get rid of those roses, mm -hmm. uh, dig them up. If you do get rid of a rose that has rose rosette, then other roses around it will be fine. It's mm -hmm. only transferred from roses right. that are sick. Right. And you can, ironic, interesting, you can come back and plant into that same area that you dig up the rose mm -hmm. uh, right after that. Not so it's not going to stop you right. from growing in, in that area. It's just getting rid of actual sick roses uh, that are in the yeah. in the vicinity. Yeah, that's that's good. And I know breeding is being done or attempted to try to get around that disease too. But that that's a long-term solution. It is, uh, but it's also one that's extremely exciting for mm -hmm. B. Um, I, we at the Antique Rosum have taken on a process of trying to uh, breed using these wonderful old garden roses that we've mm -hmm. collected for years. Some of their genetics is uh, is remarkable. Obviously, you get the fragrance, you get mm -hmm. 
the tenacity of time-tested survivability. You right. want those qualities to be brought forth in modern roses. So we're breeding those with some beautiful, big David Austin-type roses okay. to get the yeah. big flower. And so that combination uh, is giving us new varieties that we feel like are going to be the future of the rose. But going on to the disease aspect, there are actually roses that have shown not to get rose rosette. And interestingly, there are some of the species roses that evolved here in the United States, uh, like uh, Rosa palustris or Rosa carolina. Some of these roses are really stingy and, and, and are, are, are shown not to get the disease in the trials that we've been that uh, A&M has been doing with, uh, right. with this rose rosette research. And so our idea is to breed those species or wild roses, get that genetics into some of our modern roses, mm -hmm. and maybe we truly will get a, a rose that genetically is, is immune from getting the, or, or at least more resistant to getting that rose rosette. Well, that's, that would be great. I, I know that it could help transform landscapes in the way that people are moving, and that's away from sprays. Uh, busy lives, uh, you know, spraying takes time too, and uh, and just wanting something solid. Texas tough, maybe we should call well, it. Well, it, it just seems, I mean, it just makes all the sense in the world to have something that you can enjoy without feeling like you're going to have to come and spray it or, mm -hmm. or, or even fertilize it. I mean, a lot of these roses that we grow at our gardens are cared for by mulches. And mm -hmm. if you think about mulches, it's Mother Nature's way of, 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 of I mean, yes. you, if you drive down the highway and you look at the forest or you look at the prairie, uh, you don't see people out there fertilizing. Or, or raking. Or, or any raking the leaves exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah. So Mother Nature knows how to, to care for her plants. And mulches are the food of these microbes that, that take care of our plants. And they provide fertilizers and stability and defenses and everything for the plants. Uh, that that is natural, that's, and so we true. don't have to get into these sprays. And yeah. that's, uh, that's a so used to the manicured that we feel like that we forget that nature's not. I actually uh, one of my memorable calls uh, about a year ago, a lady asked me, said, "Is it okay to mulch with red oak leaves?" <laughs> and my first thought was a smart aleck response, and that's nature's been doing it since the beginning of time, so yeah. I think it's safe. Yeah. Uh, but you know that. But it tells about a mindset. You know, here are these leaves. I need to rake them, put them in a bag, and get them out of here. Or burn them. They're debris. They're <laughs> yeah. debris. Or, or burn them. When, in fact, that's 75% uh, of the nutrients that tree took up during yeah, the year. It's just, it's and a, as it decomposes in that forest floor type environment, things go, go better and better. You know, up in Dallas, excuse me, the um, uh, Earth Kind Rose trial that Dr. George was, has been working on up there, they put them in and they use just wood chip mulch, mm -hmm. just like the stuff you see people grinding into the back of the trailer. Yeah. Uh, and, and they mulch them deeply and they just let it decay. And the, once they're established, they're not watering those roses unless it's just an emergency. Yeah. They never spray them. They never even fertilize them after that no. initial. It, it makes total sense. And it, interestingly, you can get a, a mulch of three or four inches that you put down and of course, if you scratch away at it and you get it to where it's, you know, touching the soil, you, that's mm -hmm. where all this life is taking place. You yeah. get the, the white mycelium of some fungus and mm -hmm. all the roly polies and all. The, I mean, everything yeah. is going on right there. That's where that transition of that breaking down of that organic matter is going into the root zone, you cool. know, in, in in servicing the roots. But you know, you can come back six months later and that. That mulch is almost gone. Yeah, it's been eaten up and converted into this wonderful compost mm -hmm. into the into the soil. That's Mother Nature's way, and it's certainly not one where you have to go and fertilize. And so, yeah. we we try to mimic that in our gardens. Mm -hmm. We try to use just mulches, no fertilizers used, no sprays. Everything you see there is just growing based on the fact that it's getting microbial life of the soil servicing mm -hmm. the plants and so it's, it's a it, wonderful and way. it works it works it works. works great that is cool now you mentioned rose breeding and a good while back i heard about you guys were were doing some of that uh i think you have plans to continue to work with the ones that had been developed selecting or we what, were we next? were so fortunate skip in having a, a student from texas a m who was getting his master's degree uh in horticulture and he mm -hmm. uh loved breeding and so he took it on to to really, um, you know, uh, accelerate our programs uh, mm -hmm. with the breeding. I had started some breeding earlier on, and I called them the Pioneer Roses. 
and it was a it was a, a kind of an amateur stab at it compared to what he did. But he went into the getting a gene pool that was extremely diverse from all sor- kinds of uh, you know uh, uh, sources, and and we've in- integrated that gene pool into some of our modern mm-hmm. breeding styles, and we're getting a tremendous uh, uh, amount of um, uh, diversity in our our rose offerings now. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, we're thinking about things like exfoliating bark, fall color, things mm. you don't think about in, right. in roses at all. Right. And and all at the same time, we're making sure that we create that nuance of fragrance, mm-hmm. disease resistance, you know, uh, bloom power, the things that people look for in a rose. That's a lot in one package. <laughs> it's, it's hard to get Good them luck all with in that. one. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna to take a break here and take a call. Uh, Let's see, our phone number, 845-5689, and we're going to go and talk to Mark. Hello, Mark. Howdy, Skip. Thank you so much for the show, and Mike, so much for what you do there. That Rose Emporium, for any listeners, y'all, Mike, you're too humble to say it, but it, it's it's spectacular. It's a great place to go and take your family and friends and um Ethel Burgess was the only daughter of the longest-serving president of A&M, Dr. Walt. And Ethel Burgess and her daughter, um, Lou Cashin, went out there all the time. And as I go out there, I I have the memories of them and, and my folks who loved it. And I just commend everybody to go out there. I'm glad Belinda's dream was made or done by an Aggie. Because uh, <laughs> I tell you what, you stick that thing in the ground. I mean, if I can get it to bloom in the first month, anybody can. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a... That's a great story. Thanks yeah. for calling. I love that. Uh, is I, uh, I, I think Blinda's dream too is 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 a is a fabulous rose. And uh, you know, we were the first to introduce it from uh, Dr. Basie, uh, and of course uh, Bill Welch. He found uh, he had a relationship with Dr. Basie here at A and M, and he they saved that rose off of a burn pile. I understand because wow. uh, Doc, right? Dr. Basie was not totally happy with it in terms of its completeness. He wanted a a very, very disease-free rose that had fragrance, and he was also working hard on thornlessness. And so those qualities were not evident in that one rose, even though uh, Bill Welch saw that rose and said, boy, that it has great bloom power. It looks like a rose. Yeah. blooms all the time. Let's, let's see if we can save that. And sure enough, uh, uh, you look at it now, and it's sold throughout the United States. And so I, is I just, that right? Yeah, it's a fabulous story. Yeah, the absolutely. Aggies, and I think Bill is an LSU guy, but he's an Aggie through and through. Right? Oh, that's right, for and, sure. And Diane, his, his wife, was so precious. And, and uh, you know, the, all of these listeners, the A&M program is spectacular. These pecans throughout Texas, you think of Fred Bryson and Benton Story and... Uh, so anyway, thanks for thanks for the beauty, and I'm with y'all. Those knockouts knock me out. They're too much, too boring. Yeah, you know. we can do but, better. But if you make them, you know, where they're maroon, I'll buy one. <laughs> I haven't bought one yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and there's some varieties though that y'all are working on there that are are just spectacular. But that old those old guard from the cemeteries and that salvia. You know, y'all, if you get a chance, go out there. I, I used to go there with Zoom from a and I'd skip out on A&M Methodist uh, and go to go to the Rose Emporium with my dog, Yolani. And, you know, I felt closer to God there than in church, but then my Catholic friend said, get back to church. So All right, Mark. It's a great place to go, though, a great place to go. And oh, thank, thank you, you for your call. That's so we, great. We appreciate okay. the call, but this isn't true confessions. This is garden success, so we don't need <laughs> You take care. Our phone number, 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, well, let's see. we got so much we could talk about on roses. Uh, let's talk a little bit about utilizing roses in a landscape. Again, we, we go back to what the picture in the mind is. When you say roses, they picture the rose garden, and it basically is a bunch of lined-up soldiers you know, for cutting. What about the best, most creative ways that you would recommend to incorporate roses? And I know this is a long question I'm asking, but in the process, 
not all roses are rose bushes. You know, we have climbers, we have miniatures, and, exactly. and they, they come in different uh, rose groups. So yeah. could you answer that oh, huge question I just threw out there? Well, our tagline out there is that um, we do not have rose gardens. We have gardens that have roses in them. There you go. And the understanding or the, 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 the view of that is is that roses belong throughout. I mean, they do need sun. That's kind of the drawback. But when we walk through our gardens, we find these roses or we have used these roses in so many different applications. Uh, we embellish the architecture of our home or fence or walkways. Uh, we use them with perennials, with annuals, with other plants. So there's n really no, uh, you know, there's no uh, limit to the mm -hmm. to the diversity of which they fill. Um, I even wrote a book. It's called Empress of the Garden, where the rose is the empress. And the w way I talk about roses is the fact that they all are different, and they all have this different moxie mm -hmm. in the garden that is is kind of powerful. And, and, and in some ways, they kind of have a personality. Mm. And so I wrote the book in the, with the idea that this personality, like you've got a dreamy romantic, a rose that climbs up on an arbor and drips down and is the place where you want to have your morning coffee or, mm -hmm. or, or wind it late as the evening uh, you know, concludes. Or you have the, an empress called the tenacious tomboy, mm -hmm. like Mermaid or Cherokee or mm -hmm. Peggy Martin, mm -hmm. that will outgrow any situation you put it in. Right. It's going to grow beyond those means. And so there's yeah. different personalities these roses have, yeah. and that almost dictates how they can be mm -hmm. used in these different garden settings. But it, w w you could even use them in a very large container. If, if it were the right rose you picked for that, you could use them to go over the arbor, like you said. And There's so many applications, and they're all so different. I mm -hmm. mean, you would be perplexed if you tried to put them in a rectangular rose garden because they'd yeah. all be different in the sizes yes. and the shapes. So that's the beauty of the rose is their diversity. Mm -hmm. And in that diversity, they create you being a garden artist to use them right. as different brush strokes in different parts of your garden. Years ago, I saw a row of um, old blush. And I don't know if that was at the Emporium or where I was, but it was a long row and they were using it just as a hedge. And, yeah. and that works well. That's, that's in our garden. We have it oh. on a split rail fence. Uh, we don't like to plant any rose by itself, so it had... Uh, the cemetery white iris growing okay. underneath it. And then uh, we also have all the wildflowers in the background there. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful and very simple way to grow them. And the maintenance of these roses, too, is kind of interesting. It's not like the hybrid tea roses where you cut them to produce these long stem flowers. Mm -hmm. We prune these roses usually using head shears in order to shape or mold them so that they are fit into the context of, of the garden that they rely in. Right. So that split rail fence, we want it to be blooming on that top rail. Yes. So we just prune it below that, and it grows out and blooms, and we do that a couple of times a year. It's very simple. That That is that is interesting. You mentioned Peggy Martin, and I guess that's my favorite, my newest favorite of the <laughs> roses. Uh, I, everywhere I've seen it, you guys have it on a structure that sort of looks like a mushroom-type structure. And when it's cascading over the sides of that and these long strings of pink blooms are just hanging down, it, wow, that's amazing. I, the, the previous caller mentioned the, you know, uh, uh, the garden as a place of religion. Well, I, I truly feel that way. It's a place where you can go out and kind of lose yourself, mm -hmm. and that's what you, a garden should do. Uh, when we get these roses up in the air, like Peggy Martin, mm -hmm. dripping down from these structures, it is truly a, a romantic and dramatic uh, display, and it's, uh, it's, it's just fun to be underneath it. Yeah, that is cool. Well, we've got a call. Uh, I think we'll go take it. It's um, the number, by the way, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And let's go now and talk to Charles. Hello, Charles. Hi, Skip. Uh, you said I could uh, talk about something other than roses. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, about oh nine years ago, I was out at uh, Rose Emporium and bought a couple of ligularia uh, mm -hmm. to plant in the shady spot, and just loved them. These you know, enormous leaves, the size of dinner plates, and really quite dramatic. Are, are the, yours spotted the, with with yellow? No, no, mine were all green, uh, solid, were, green. Uh, solid okay. color. All right, uh, and. If, uh, planted them under uh, a crepe myrtle, uh, mm -hmm. deep shade, uh, and they did 
fine, but as the years have gone by, the crepe myrtle has gotten bigger, uh, and I'm sure that, that the ground underneath it has probably gotten harder to keep wet. And, mm-hmm. and I just, you know, can cannot put enough water on that thing in the summertime to keep it keep it going. And I think this summer perhaps finally did it in. Okay. I was just wondering what sort of suggestions you might have for for shade loving things that could fit in a in a bed that's you know that's going to be dominated by a large right uh, tree. Well. The the ligularia does need moisture, and it it would also really love a forest floor type soil where you have a lot of uh, organic matter in the soil and you keep it you keep it moist. Uh, so as far as going underneath a crepe myrtle to plant, uh, just remember the closer you get to the trunk, the more roots there are in the soil, and the more impossible it is to dig a hole. That's true with a lot of trees. Uh, so you might want to consider something that. Uh, sprawls outward, a little vining plant. If you can keep it moist enough, um, oh my gosh, the plant name just escaped me. <laughs> I was about to say, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. I've seen Asian jasmine used that way. Of course, that's not a super, uh, you know, creative plant. It's it's very common, but you, it can find a spot to get roots down, and then its runners go and crawl all over the places where it's basically solid roots. Uh, mm-hmm. That'd be an option. You could go around the periphery and line it with something like Aztec grass or liriope uh, just to kind of make a border around it. Uh, Mike, do you have some other thoughts on a spot like that? Uh, I, hate to, I hate to throw the, <laughs> throw you, uh, you know, <laughs> go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, uh, shade is is, uh, is, uh, is always a tricky thing. It's hard to get, and, and, you, and the caller is right in trying to get foliage. Because that's typically what you get is, uh, mm-hmm. and that ligularia is is a is a is a good one. Uh, I guess there's no. Uh, I think Skip hit it best by saying if you could add a lot of organic matter into that area, you might be able to bring the water back to a level again where you could grow successfully that. But uh, that would probably take putting, uh, you know, some compost and some stuff down in there um, mm-hmm. more often than just annually, or um, right. at least mm-hmm. annually, in order to. To, to be able to grow that, but um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I I think of things that uh, that that I don't really admire, and yeah. it, like uh, uh, the uh, Mexican petunia okay. would certainly. Uh, okay, really. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are things that would would completely it's mesh an, that area. It's the most enthusiastic yeah. volunteer in the world. That's I right. Uh, so um, that, that's that's one you can't you can't give away. Yeah. No, it's it's a. Uh, it's extremely invasive, mm-hmm. but I- interesting enough, as invasive as it is, it makes it be one of the most successful plants. So mm-hmm. in a very tough area, sometimes you can plant those things and be a little bit, uh, it's a little bit more redeeming. Yeah. Um, the plant I was trying to think of was a juga, uh, but it also needs moisture, yeah. but it can put up with quite a bit of shade and uh, kind of spreads out. It's, yeah, to it's me, pretty invasive too, though, isn't it? Uh, not too bad. Not at a pace okay. that I would be worried about. Uh, okay. okay. It, it appears to me that, it, you know, in order to grow plants in that situation with the uh, the competition being the crepe myrtle's roots and everything, you, that you are going to have to just make it a little bit more organic friendly. Mm-hmm. And I think you'll be a lot more successful with anything you grow. I would, okay. I would consider, too, just mulching it as far out as aesthetically you can tolerate uh, making a circle or whatever shape around it and uh, just leave it as a mulched place. You could always set some very attractive containers here or there uh, and essentially get your soil above the ground. Uh, so I think that's about as creative as I can be right at this moment. Okay. All right. Thanks. So. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, Charles. Uh, we're going to go back to the phones and talk to Kim. Hello, Kim. Hi, Skip. Um, I have a non rose question. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, what are the best uh, steps we could take right now to help prepare our sod for a better season next year? Boy, it was it's a rough coming one. back, but it looks pretty stressed. Yeah, it's, it's, it was a rough one for our lawns. Well, keep in mind that as we go into the cooler weather, lawn growth slows to a stop. Uh, that it's not putting out new runners and roots and things. It'll probably be next uh, sometime in March or early April before it really begins to put down roots again. Uh, so uh, what I would do is put a light fertilization, not too much, of something that makes sure you get a nitrogen and potassium in it. The, those go together well. And moving into the plant, 
uh, store, helping it store the carbohydrates, which essentially becomes the antifreeze uh, for the winter time. Uh, so if your plant is weak, you can do that going into into the winter. And as it comes out in the spring, it'll be stronger too, because it just it takes it a long time to wake up. We we, we need the weather to warm up a little bit for it. Uh, other than that, the only thing to keep in mind is when your lawn gets thin and sunlight hits the soil, nature plants a weed. And so you may want to take some steps to get ahead of that. Our cool season weeds have already germinated, but uh, in February would be a time to do a treatment for warm season if you're inclined to do that kind of thing. If not, I would probably get a, a very fine textured compost and top dress over the lawn basically to fall in among the grass and just sort of block some soil out so that you don't have the same amount of weed problem next year. So you're saying wait until February to apply any type of weed control? Yeah, about early to mid. It, weeds, okay. Weed germination is based on soil temperature and no two years are alike. So we have to kind of shoot at an average. But usually if you can get something out early to mid uh, February as a pre-emergent in this area, you can take care of most of the initial germination of weeds and sometimes we put a second down. I basically don't do that in my yard. I don't, I don't, I don't like getting out and spraying or spreading that kind so what what i do is just do the the regular fertilizer recommendations so in spring after you've mowed the lawn twice put on your first fertilizer and then mow water and fertilize your way to a really dense grass and it'll recover pretty fast if you do those things yeah i've noticed the weeds have gotten very um bad in the areas where the grass died so that's right yeah do you recommend anything to try to adjust the pH, or do we need to have it tested? It, it, it is not going to be possible to adjust the pH okay. Uh, yeah, okay. of, an, of a lawn. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kim. Our number is 845-5689 if you'd like to call in. And I'm visiting today uh, with Mike Shoup of the Antique Rose Emporium. And we've talked about a lot of different things uh, regarding roses. Um, the... Um, uh, one thing that I'd, I'd wanted to mention, we kind of touched on it with one of the callers, uh, is the Antique Rose Emporium is really a destination place. You have nurseries that you drive up, you get your plants, and you go home. And then there's a few nurseries around Texas where you want to stay, you want to walk and look and smell and, and all of that type of thing. And if you've never been out there, I, I really encourage you to do so. It's a, it's a very uh, short drive to get there. It doesn't take long. And uh, of course, the best time of year is the time of year when ever, everybody else and their dog is going to want to come out, like uh, April when the, oh gosh, the blue bonnets are, are just at their peak and uh, the roses are looking really good coming out of winter. So if you, if you want to take pictures, that would be an awesome time. But I, I go out even during the off season when it's a little quieter and I can walk around and see things. You guys sell plants other than just roses. Yeah, we, we, we sell gardening. And uh, just like you say, we the seasons are, are part of the joy of going out there because uh, yes, you can you can see the the intensity of the colors and all the bloom and everything in April, but uh, there there are people now and uh, that certainly come out throughout the year and and see the garden in its bones, uh, so to speak, in, in in the middle of the winter. Uh, now is a good time to see it as it's starting to rest and all the grasses are in the middle. Grasses are in bloom and it's very pretty. Roses and grasses are beautiful together. Uh, we have different themed gardens out there. It's not, uh, it's not really uh, positioned as a commercial nursery. It's, it's, it's more of a true garden experience where we want people to walk around and just kind of like uh, lose, their, lose their thoughts uh, from the, yeah. the, the modern day yeah. uh, you know, hustle and bustle. And uh, and that's what we've strived to do. And, and we sell a lot of native plants, uh, my mm -hmm. earlier love, and um, a lot of perennials, a lot of annuals. Mm -hmm. uh, not uh, not a lot of mulches. We leave that to the, the large stores. We, yeah. we, we want to sell, the, you know, plants that people can be mm -hmm. uh, successful with as well as be uh, somewhat unique uh, okay. in terms of the roses, uh, fragrance that you get, and some of the cutting-edge perennials that we, we also grow. Well, Mike, uh, we're really 
talking a lot about roses today, and I'm going to ask you a question that I personally detest being asked. <laughs> Which <laughs> what, one is your favorite? What, that's it. You <laughs> saw it coming, didn't you? <laughs> Let's, I know you're not going to probably be able to answer it that way. Let's do it this way. What are, what are however many you want to mention, of your favorite climbers? Yeah. What are some of your favorite uh, shrubs and why? Shrub I, roses. You, you just... Uh, you just answer, ask the question the correct way because <laughs> the roses are fill so many seats mm -hmm. uh, in in terms of of your gardening, yeah. uh, you know, platform. They they are um, you have you have plants that are great for pots, and some of those are you know some of the smaller growing ones that like uh, Marie Pavier, like Marie Pavier, uh, Marie Daly. Got several new ones that are that are uh, real exciting that way. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that are coming on to the, to the scene. Uh, Doreen Centennial. It's a terrible name, but it's a great rose. And, uh, and is, butterf that a, is butterfly that a smaller blues. stature? It, they are roses that actually cascade. Mm. So not oh. only do they fill up the pot, but they kind of fall off the edges. Okay. And so we're not used to thinking of roses that way, but that's mm -hmm. the way we are trying to make them fit into so many different aspects of gardening. Mm -hmm. And so you've got that. You've got. Uh, I call them the stay-at-home moms. So they're kind of roses you plant and you can do your other chores because they're going to be there for the long haul, okay. taking care of things, always blooming. These are roses like old blush that mm -hmm. you find in the cemetery still surviving today. They're yeah. there. Uh, they don't, uh, you know, they don't look good all year long, but they mm -hmm. look great a lot of the year, you okay. know. So it's just a fun, easy-to-grow rose that you don't have to fuss with. Uh, we've got wonderful climbers, and I do really call them the dreaming romantics because there's something about having roses up above, above, above your head. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I kind of joke about the fact when our hedge of old blush blooms, we have a lot of people coming over and taking pictures. But when people see or when our climbing roses go into bloom, that's when Southern Living and and Better Homes and Gardens comes and takes pictures right. because it's the ooh and ah of mm -hmm. the garden yeah. uh, that you are creating with the climbers. They are well beyond that normal stature of that one dimension on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so there are so many wonderful climbers. They take a lot of work. They need to be trained. Mm -hmm. You don't want to create chaos. You, you bought a structure there that you're wanting to adorn. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people call me and they say, what, what do I do? I have chaos. You know, it's grabbing children off of bicycles in the street. <laughs> it's it's those types of things that climbers will do. But at the same time, if you harness them and put them on that structure, make that structure look good, it is awe-inspiring. And it is a mm -hmm. great, it's a great thing to have in the garden. So you have all these, all these different, you know, ways to fill up a garden with different types of roses. Okay. It's not just one plant. So, so I can't give you. Uh, well, so we talked about, like, let, let's talk about some specific climbers. I think, uh, of course, the um, Peggy Martin is, is is a good one. It, it has a lot of attributes we're looking for. Uh, the, one of the more famous ones is um, Lady Banks, the mm -hmm. white and the yellow mm -hmm. form. Uh, and I... Re, when, when, a while back, I traced down that story about the bride that took one to Tucson in a buckboard wagon, and yeah. what it covered a quarter of an acre. We we went down there and Did saw you that. See it? It, it, it is. You it can't is get your arms around the trunk. Yeah, it's that big, and it uh, covers. Uh, so at one time, it used to cover an acre. I uh, mean, it would go 200 feet one way and 200 another. That's an acre, yeah. and it was just a it a more enormous structure. It's a beautiful rose. Yeah. Obviously happy in Tucson, yeah. Arizona, yeah. Uh, or not Tucson. Uh, it was um, Tombstone. 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 Uh, okay. Tombstone, Arizona, and uh, but uh, the Banksia and, and Peggy Martin are are both spring bloomers for mm -hmm. the most part. Yeah. They throw out, you know, they're they're heralds of spring. When they bloom, everything is on its way to bloom. And, and, and that's they, that's and really they, true of a lot of those climbers, like ballerina and others. They're they're once bloomers. No, ballerina's not. Oh, ballerina and, comes back. Yeah, ballerina is a repeat bloomer. Okay. There are many repeat blooming roses, uh, Skip, that are just uh, spectacular because when you have the fall bloom. In Texas, sometimes that can be uh, as remarkable as a spring bloom. Okay. And there are roses like in the Noisette family, okay. like uh, Rev Dior, Crepuscule, uh, Lamarck, mm -hmm. Madame Alfred Carey. These are all beautiful, fragrant roses. And what's yeah. really beautiful about them is that they don't have strong stems. Okay. And so when they're blooming above your head, 
the flowers are dripping down, okay. looking at you. So okay. it really creates a romantic feeling in the garden. And I've seen you guys out at the Emporium use roses on a post uh, where they, they kind of grow up. And I'm assuming that that's not how you would put a, a Lady Banks. No. <laughs> it would eat the it's post. A, it's a, a great comment, Skip, because uh, we call them mannerly climbers. Mm -hmm. And there are so many different gradations of these climbers. Some mm -hmm. are extremely vigorous, like you cannot control. Mm -hmm. But some are, are perfect for a pillar mm -hmm. or a small trellis. And so you can accent, you know, your architecture of your home or something based on using those types of roses. Okay. Sombrelle is one of my favorite. Climbing Pinky is another one. Mm -hmm. Both of these roses are, are perfect for, the, uh, for a little bit more of a controlled element in your okay. garden. But they do still climb and yeah. uh, create that wonderful quality that's up above your head mm. when they're in bloom. That is that is nice. That's a, a nice mental image, too, of the way these, these roses uh, uh, can be utilized and could enhance your, your garden. You know, the we talk about the landscape, and our landscapes have areas, just like your house has rooms. And uh, roses, or a rose arch, is a great way to go from one area to another. Uh, it's yes, just, you have entryways mm -hmm. that you can uh, encircle with these, and we certainly do that. There, there are other kind of roses. I call them balloon-skirted ladies, and these are roses that are <laughs> like Penelope or like Cornelia that, that actually have arching canes that go up and then down like an umbrella. Okay. And so they're beautiful by water's edge or, or just as a specimen. Um, and, and so uh, you have to have the space mm -hmm. because they'll be six or eight feet wide ultimately. Uh, uh, cascading over themselves, but they create a wonderful, uh, you know, kind of a free-forming. Well, that's that is that's cool. Uh, I I think what for those of you listening to the description he's giving, imagine this giant spider on the ground that's with right. the legs that arch out that's and, right. and land everywhere. Yeah. I saw one of those out at your place one yeah. time that yeah. was really really attractive. Well, let's uh, go back to the phones and take a call from Susan. How are you, Susan? I am doing well. I've enjoyed listening about the roses. I love roses. But I wanted to call in and give a little um, last-minute plug for the Aggie corn maze that is on campus. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. And, and and I got to experience it last weekend, and mm -hmm. I can vouch that it is worth the trip out there. Any age. I saw all ages out there, and it was fantastic and it really did expand this year, and mm -hmm. they've got some equipment out there. They've got an entire patch of sunflowers mm -hmm. that they've grown. They've mm -hmm. got the most beautiful maroon cotton growing. Mm -hmm. Lots of photo opportunities and an amazing maze that is quite difficult, actually. It'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll surprise you. I measured some corn while I was out there, and it was actually nine foot two inches tall oh in one goodness. place. Oh so it's a great corn maze, and um, so it is this weekend. Um, and there's different hours, and really the best way is to just get on Facebook and go to the Texas A&M Agronomy Society page and or type in Aggie Corn Maze, and it would probably pull up for you. But also on this Saturday, they're going to have a car meet there as well. Okay. So, um, yeah, lots going on. Yeah. Now, um, I received an email that had, of course, the QR codes where you could sign up. Right. But I didn't see like a website. Is if People that are listening, is there some place they can go to, to learn about all the dates and time, hours that you're open and so on? Well, through Facebook. Facebook. It's okay. It's, they don't have a website, but they do have a Facebook page. Okay. So Ta you can go to Facebook and um, search it. Texas A&M Agronomy Society, and or you could put in the search word Aggie Corn Maze, and that would pull up as well. All right. But there are, if you do not do that, you can go and pay. If you don't pay in advance, you can pay there. Okay. So don't let that stop you from All going. Right. But, um, yeah, basically the hours are in the evenings. Um, Saturdays all day. Sunday they're staying up out late. Um, okay. because of Halloween, so that would be a very interesting after dark maze. Okay. Say, Susan, <laughs> so, uh, tell us again, where is it? Where is it? Where will people go to see this? This is a strange name for a road, but it's letter F and the and sign B, as in boy, mm -hmm. road. 
F and B Road, which F&B. is actually parallel to University. Just behind just one street over. Just behind the yep. vet school, right? Yes. All over right. in that area. All right. Easy to find. There's a great okay. big huge combine sitting out there in the middle of the field. All right. Well you thank won't you. Miss it. Thank you for thank that you reminder. So much. You bet. Well, I before I run out of time today, I want to talk about a few things going on around town. Uh, Friday and Saturday, November 4th and 5th, the Lions Extension Club presents their annual Christmas Cottage Arts, Crafts, and Bake Sales at the uh, Le- American Legion Hall out in Somerville, and it's from 9 to 5. Now, we got a few garden clubs meeting uh, on Thursday, November 3rd, the Gardens at Texas A&M University. Uh, no, excuse me, <laughs> the, at the Ringer library meeting room in College Station at 6.30. A speaker from the gardens at Texas A&M University will give a talk about gardening. There's no charge for this, and you can call the Ringer Library uh, for more information. On Saturday the 5th, the Rio Brazos Audubon Society is having a bird 101 bird walk at Lick Creek Park Visitor Center at 8 30 a.m. Uh, there, if bring binoculars or there may be a few loaners you can use if you don't have some. And finally, appropriate for today, Tuesday, November 8th at noon, the Brazos County Rose Society meets at the Outback Steakhouse in College Station. If you're interested, you can call Maggie at 778-4252. Well, so we've got about 15 seconds left, <laughs> so I want to thank you for being on oh, the show love today, Mike. I, I, I enjoyed and I learned uh, a lot today, too, as well. So thank you so much oh, uh, for being part of this. Uh, just uh, tell your neighbors that if they're interested in gardening, they can hear Garden Success on the radio here at KAMU-FM, or they can go online and listen to past shows. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.